Your story is waiting for you today. Your story has something new to say. But your story will only come out to play when you're alone. Alone. Alone in a room with invisible people. The following episode may contain swearing. Alone in a Room with Invisible People is brought to you by hollyswritingclasses.com. Hi, I'm Rebecca Gallardo, the host of Alone in a Room with Invisible People. I'm here today with author and teacher Holly Lyle, and today's topic is writing to market versus selling out. Now, before we get to the topic, just like every week, we're going to talk about our accomplishments this week. So, Holly, how did it go for you? Um, uh, this week was eye-opening. Uh, I, I hit a wall. Um, I was, as, as some folks know, uh, I have been writing on three separate different novels each week. And, uh, I have been writing Mondays on Dead Man's Party and that went beautifully. That was, I got my 15, 15 words change and that went really well. Um, Tuesdays and Wednesdays, I was writing on Moon and Sun, The Emerald Sun. Thursdays and Fridays, I was writing on Wishbone Conspiracy, uh, my next Cadence Drake novel. And um, I hit a wall on Moon and Sun where I realized that it was not coming together the way I needed. Um, and I went down a rabbit hole and got no words for two days in a row and got really frustrated and uh, also got kind of sucked into marketing as a way to pacify my my muse that was very unhappy with me. Um, and I realized that uh, the the experiment, as interesting as it was, was not beneficial to me and to my fiction. So uh, I am putting Moon on Sun, Moon and Sun on hold. It is the novel that required me to go back through and dig much deeper than what I've been doing. And I realized that I had taken it in a wrong direction, um, that I have to completely rethink. And part of the complete rethinking I'm doing is actually part of what we're going to be talking about this week. Um, but uh, I did do very well on Caden Drake. So what I'm going to be doing now is Mondays is still going to be Dead Man's Party. Tuesdays is going to be marketing, advertising, um, building funnels for, for my fiction, trying to to get it more noticeable, doing cover art, doing, uh, not cover art, but doing cover layouts and things like that to make, to, to give my books a little bit better chance of finding their readers. Uh, Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays are going to be two hours apiece for, uh, for the Wishbone Conspiracy, my Cain Strake novel. And, uh, you know, Fridays, Saturdays is off and, and Sundays is, is this. So, <laughs> and I did get my, my 2000 words on Thursday and Friday for, for the wishbone conspiracy. And next week I'll have two hours, three times in the week, uh, in order to get that so that I'll have it done by around the middle of May in first draft. So I'm excited. About nice. That. Yeah. 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 It, it, I'm actually glad that you decided to not work on three books at once. Well, it was it was interesting, and it was it was very encouraging for a while to realize that I could. But when one book requires that much rethinking, which the wish, um, which uh, Moon and Sun, the Emerald Sun, really does, including probably a better title. But um, I was going in a very wrong direction, and Matt and I had this long discussion. Matt, being both my husband and my editor. Uh, we had this long discussion where uh, I he pinpointed a couple of problems that, again, we're going to be talking a little bit about today. So uh, we'll get to that after you talk about your week. Oh, I just, I did very well word-wise. I got um, my scene, basically I'm writing for um, my pen name at the moment, and I'm writing um, per scene. And I've gotten either the entire scene or a scene and a half or even two scenes done every day this week. Nice. Um, I'm more than halfway through. And this one was, I, th I think I started it right before I got sick. And then, man, that sickness just threw me out. Like, I'm still a little sick. 
Yeah. Like I can still, I'm still coughing. I still have congestion and I can still feel it. But luckily it's almost completely out of my system. Yay. <laughs> it's just, it took a hell of a, I took a hell of a beating from that. Oh, and we, we are going to be doing a podcast on your writing system. That will be, I think that's what we're going to be recording next week because the response was very clear. <laughs> oh, yes, it was. <laughs> so let's get to today's topic, writing to market versus selling out. And I, I think that this one was my idea to do because we had a lot of people who would have listened to the last episode that we did and would hear you and me, comp- well, mostly you though, <laughs> <laughs> Like talking about um, writing things that, you know, just for the money. Like, oh, well, this makes a lot of money, so I want to go write this. And like both of us, though, have said several times on this this podcast that you don't want to do that because you are not going to produce the best content you're going to hate your work you're going to hate writing all this this and that right and i really wanted to cover the difference and i wanted to bring this up especially since you've been reading a lot of the the marketing books and the the things recently and it's been kind of opening your eyes to certain stuff (laughs) i definitely wanted to cover this because there's a huge difference and i think that it's really important to mention this stuff to people who, you know, are listening and, and looking at you um, as somebody who has a lot of experience and has been through a lot of stuff. Yes. <laughs> and I'm about to go through a lot more, let me tell you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, okay, so, so let's actually get started on this. Uh, with a definition of writing to market, and then a definition of selling out because they are not in any way, shape, or form the same thing. Um, writing to market is identifying a readership of people who love to read what you love to write. Let me emphasize that again. People who love to read what you love to write that is large enough to support your career and creating stories to entertain those people. That's a that has some very important pieces in it. But before we do that, let's look at the definition for selling out. Selling out is cranking out shoddy shit you hate for morons you don't respect while getting rich. And this is, um, this is how people who are trying to crank things out, see their potential readership as, and I I'm using air quotes here as the morons who like this shit. And if that is what you are trying to do, if you are trying to write what you consider garbage to feed to people you don't respect, they're not going to like you. They're not going to be fooled by you. They're not going to be, uh, they're not going to leap in front of what you are, you are cranking out. And I hate that term. I hate the term cranking out. Um, writing quickly is writing what you, you can still write what you love while writing quickly. You can, Yeah. yeah. And so that's, I want to go back to writing to market because. Well, I want to say one thing too. This is not writing to your fans. This is one big, huge mistake that so many, even big successful um, creators make. Mm -hmm. If you watch the difference between Stranger Things season one and Stranger Things season two, you will see people writing to their fans. They are not writing to the story that they created. They're not keeping the characters true. They are destroying what they created by trying to appease the fans or by saying, oh my God, look, these people love what we wrote. Let's give them more of what they love. No, no. No, 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 no. Even well-intentioned. That is not, that is not the right, I, let's make Hopper even more of a debt. No. Right. No. The reason that the people love the characters in the first one was because of who they were and because of subtle things. You don't shove the things down their throat. So it's the same thing. It's not writing to the, what the fans say they want or say they love or say they like, because that can potentially destroy your work. Yes. Yes. That is, you, you have to. Um, You have to write what you love and it has to continue to be what you love. So you definitely, you definitely need to be writing 
what you love and what is important to you and what matters to you and what brings you joy. But there are some limitations to that. And part of the research that I have been doing this week about trying to make my fiction sell better opened my eyes to a couple of things that I have been doing wrong. And, and I'm going to, I'm going to say something a little bit evil and snarky here too, which is that while lots of writers would love to sell out, the problem is that readers being readers are very rarely morons and can smell the stink of cranked out shit written by someone who despises them from space. Readers are not morons. Readers are people who, who, who engage in telepathy for fun. Okay. They immerse themselves in, in the thoughts of another person as their entertainment with no images, no, no sounds, no anything to feed them, just their own native intelligence in which they are, they are recreating a world, another person created from thought with nothing but thought. And they're seeing these things and feeling these things. And so this is one of the more complex forms of entertainment ever invented. It is telepathy. And these are people who are engaging in telepathy for fun. And if you think those people are stupid, um, we are looking at the wrong person to call moron. Okay. People are who readers are not stupid and readers recognize quickly, um, things that have been written down. Even re readers can even be harsh when they love a book that was written with love and pointing out and they can point out problems and they can point out issues and they can point out holes. The last thing you want to do is start quote cranking out shit. Yeah. Oh God. <laughs> For these readers that have fallen in love with your old stuff, or maybe, you know, you're going to people and, and you're writing in a genre that you don't even read or you don't like or anything like you've read five books just so you know how to write them <laughs> readers like mom's saying are very very almost intuitive especially if you're if, if there is a voracious market for something and you start trying to write to that market even though it's not your thing the readers that read this market are just as smart as readers in any other market. Yes. They know what they like. They they know what should be in their stories. They know when they can see a pretender. Uh huh. Yeah. So you have to identify a genre you love. Um. But if you are like me, a voracious reader, you can get yourself into some very very large trouble. Um, because writing to market requires identifying people who love to read what you love to write. And therein lies the problem. I identified myself as my potential reader from the very first. And I read everything. I read science fiction, fantasy, romance, horror, mysteries, hard-boileds, westerns, non-fiction, um, science, archaeology, uh, just uh, cereal boxes. I read everything. If you are writing everything, um, well, let me, let, me, let me show you here, okay? People, your readers are looking for what they love without anything they hate. They are looking for, without anything that they hate, that they are uncomfortable with, or that they don't understand. So a, a, a romance, a two-market romance, is a story that tells um, lovers who meet, who, who lose each other, and then who get each other back. That is a pure romance. It is um, boy meets girl, girl meets girl, boy meets boy, whatever. Okay. Uh, and by lose each other, she, she doesn't mean, you know, they, they physically lose each other. It, mean, it means that they could maybe just meet and not like each other. Right. Right. Boy, the, the, the standard old summary of a romance is boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy gets girl. And, you know, you change that for all of the different variations now, and it's still the same thing. That is a romance. A suspense romance is lovers in danger 
Okay, that's a two-word description of a genre that is very popular. Suspense romance, lovers in danger. Paranormal romance is haunted lovers. It is, it is that element of the paranormal and people who are in love. And then you get into my genres. And let me describe my, the genre of my very first novel that ever sold and my current novel. And you are going to see why people keep wondering, well, why doesn't she sell more? Because this is something that I just figured out. Thanks to Matt. Thanks to um, a long discussion that we had. Okay. This is the genre description for um, Fire in the Mist, which was my first R. Hell novel. It was the first thing that sold. And it is science fiction disguised as fantasy with tech-driven magic, plot essential archaeology, six-limbed sapient literate apex predator aliens who look like European dragons versus humans escaped from Earth and settling a new planet where the first novel was well disguised as fantasy and the protag was a teenage girl who discovered the power of her magic through tragedy and went to magic school to prove the teachers wrong before saving the world and getting knocked up. Yeah, but that's also throwing a lot of the sentence in there. That is, well, that is describing every single element that is in that book. And yeah, so that's not what you did for the romance. So it's not like it's an exact comparison. No, well, but, no, I but mean, there that is... for a genre is, is yeah, yeah, not clean. <laughs> right, there is, there is no way. And, and if you were listening to that as I started... You might have been interested in the book, but as I went further and further in and threw in a combination of science fiction and fantasy, plot essential archaeology, dragons but that are actually aliens, um, the, a, a, set, humans settling a new planet, um, the, the standard fantasy tropes of teenage girl discovers her power of her magic through tragedy goes to magic school to prove the teachers wrong and then the twists uh after saving the world of getting knocked up so that you can tell that she is not a a an air quotes virtuous teenage girl um but one who does in fact sleep around and is is using birth control uh in the first scene of the book while discussing this with her mother um you, you can see that I went in a lot of places that people didn't go with that book. And the first one sold very well because it felt like a real fantasy. The second ones and third ones because they were moving more and more into the science fiction element, which was the Del Muri barrier, which was a technological artifact that accidentally locked these people on this island, um, where outside of this island, there are humans and there are the, the Klawe, which are the sapient, dragonish aliens uh, who have their own civilization, their own literature, their own all of this stuff. Um, these people on the outside are in this science fiction world, but the people on the inside are in this world that looks like it runs by magic. And at the point where I had tried to go with that, it broke it broke what people loved about the series because they thought it was fantasy because the first book was. And those books sold progressively less from book one to book three, and it was canceled by book four. Okay, now the other one is Settled Space because not having identified my mistake, I did not learn from my mistake. So even today, I have been doing this same thing. And the Settled Space universe is... Cadence Drake, um, my Longview stories. It is space tech science fiction with a unique faster than light travel, widely human settled space where no aliens have yet been discovered, genetically engineered vampires with shape shifting and mind control, hard boiled detective plots from the point of view of a black female kick ass spaceship captain and an LGBTS, that is lesbian, bi, gay, trans, straight social structure in which neither race nor gender are a big deal to anyone, and with some military sci fi spaceship battles and an overall libertarian philosophy and one guy who is 30 percent tiger and based on my uncle nick it's a that nobody knows about that last one yeah well that's um that was tangerine so if you there's, have, a, there's a lot again in there but boiling it down it's it's political sci-fi um space I, I would say fantasy shifter almost kind of in there because yeah. of the last one yeah um 
yeah, there, there's a lot to that as far as the genre. I mean, you could probably, it's like Dead Man's Party again. Mm-hmm. Is this, because you've gone over that a million times too. Right. And mentioned all of the different genres that that one has become as well. Right. So yeah, you're definitely, you've never been one to write to market. No, no. And uh, because I want to start paying the bills with my fiction, <laughs> along with my nonfiction, um, and because I am a good writer and people do like write my stories, and I would like for more of them to find and read my <laughs> stories, um, I am now looking at figuring out a market in which I can love what I write without going so freaking far off the rails every single time. Um, so I am looking at something that has a two-word or three-word description, like suspense romance or paranormal normal romance or paranormal sci-fi or or uh, urban fantasy or something so a a one a, a genre that when i say those words people know what i mean and don't get into it and go yeah but 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 why are there dragons and why are there vampires and why is there science fiction in my fantasy and why you know you you got peanut butter in my chocolate get away <laughs> it really it really is kind of like it, it's like you you your books come across, let's say it's a romance. Somebody's looking at a romance. They pick it up and then all of a sudden in the middle or, the, you know, it's like this creeping thing that keeps popping in and it's sci-fi. It's, it's, it's sci-fi. They're like, no, I just wanted a romance. Yes. Yeah, I can see where you're saying that. <clears throat> yeah, the me, vast mean, majority of people have a particular kind of telepathy they really like. And while I do have my readers, I, I, I have a few readers, you know, who will go out and buy my books because of the ungodly combinations I put together. Um, I, in order for me to pay the bills, some of what I have to do has to be more to market. So I am going to continue with Katie Drake because I love her. <laughs> I love her and I love her world. And I'm, I am finishing, I am, well, I should have, like I said, I should have the third book finished by um, May, right? I said May, I think, or mm -hmm. like the end of May. Um, but in the meantime, I am trying to figure out something that I can write that is, is less all over the place. <laughs> something that, that people can actually identify. And I am, I am at the moment considering urban fantasy, which I like. Okay. So, so let's look at, let's say that you, um, would like to have more readers, and you want to write something that uh, gives you a chance of living off of your writing. Um, so what you have to do then is is look at, well, what am I writing now? And as, as I have demonstrated, look at, well, you know, why might this not be selling? You know, or at least why might this not be selling a hundred copies a day or, you know, whatever some of these people are doing that's just, just blows my mind. Um, why might this not be gaining the readership that I would really love to have? And if you can go through and do as I have done and dissect exactly what you have in the books, you might be able to find where you have done a little bit more genre blendering than uh, has been wise. If you can write a half page description, including the elements of your fiction, <laughs> rather than a th three word description that makes sense, um, you need to step away from the genre and take a deep breath and then go back in and take a look at it. And with that in mind, let's, let's you and me just kind of brainstorm. Let's say that I wanted to broaden my audience. Okay. Let's say that you want to broad your, broaden your audience. Okay. We're, and you're, you're already pretty good at this. This for me is just entirely alien territory. <laughs> yeah. I, I stick with my genres for the most part. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and you you are writing stuff that is actually recognizable, which, um, you know, me, man, you, you need a compass, a map and, and a, a dog to get you through the thing and understand what it is by the end of it. And, you know, it's fun if you are a re will read everything that is not nailed down reader, but that is not the vast majority of readers. The vast majority of readers love what they love. And every time you add 
another thing in there uh, that they that they're uncomfortable with or that they really dislike you're going to start peeling people away i mean you figure if our hell was high it, it it started out looking very much like high fantasy with a young protagonist um who was discovering her magic and who went to magic school and this was way before harry potter and that sold really well that that book stayed in print for 10 years and earned me royalties for 10 years back in the print economy back in the old style publishing economy but the second book and the third book did nearly not nearly so well because it became more and more obvious that i was not writing high fantasy that i was writing something that included science fiction and um aliens and uh high technology that was feeding the magic not real magic high technology that was feeding the magic and all of these things that broke what people loved about the what they thought the first book was especially that now was that ever clear that the technology was what was creating the magic I had in the third book, uh, when they had the flying castles and all of that, uh, I had, they found an archaeological site um, where the, the Klawe had built these buildings and they were trying to understand what kind of people would build buildings with no stairs and landing pads. And then they found the statues of the Klawe, which are these, they're very dragon looking aliens with, uh, who used impression like cune, cuneiform or cuneiform. I'm not, I've never been entirely sure how that's pronounced, uh, writing on tablets. They're literate and they had literature and they had all of this stuff. They had libraries of, of clay tablets and they had, and it became more and more obvious that this was a, a, a different intelligent species on the planet with six limbs and see i was working into that whole if dragons have six limbs science fiction biology thing that we had mentioned in a previous episode somewhere and then they found this guy frozen in a beam of light and at the point where they broke the technology that kept him captive in that beam of light they released edris del Muri. And it also broke the Del Muri barrier so that these aliens from outside of our hell were able to fly in and meet the people. And it did not go well. And all of the magic broke because all of the magic was run by the technology. But was that clear? It was pretty clear. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I could see how if you're reading a fantasy novel and you because i i personally like i'm okay if you set up from the beginning with technology is what creates magic or the world is magic and there is natural magic i just i need to know the rules right away mm -hmm. yet what you it sounds like what you did was kind of trick your readers and not in a mist mysterious kind of how it, it's never set up like there's no question where the magic comes it's just the assumption that it is the world mm -hmm. so I personally would have been very upset if I had been involved in this three book series where the magic was coming from the earth and it was coming from the people and it was all natural and it was all lust and then all of a sudden no it's technology based I would have been kind of pissed yeah <laughs> yeah yeah and that was but for me Everything has always been a combination of, of science. I love science and a combination of science derived magic where there is a, there is a reason why it works now. Yeah. But this is technology. Yeah. Based. That was this technology is, yeah, that's, based. That's the part that would have bothered me. Mm -hmm. I love the fact that, you know, science can be magic. I, that's what I've got built up in, in Fulton Hills that I've been working on is that it is magic magic is just science that hasn't been explained yet right. basically but the technology is running magic when you think it's it's just a natural element yeah that that can be kind of frustrating or vice versa right you know right <laughs> and to me because <clears throat> because i had known from the very beginning that this was how it worked and i was building up to that and then we were going to go out into the 
outside of the barrier for the next three, 10, 30 books because this was the universe I was going to write in my whole career, like every single world I ever built. Um, this was, this was going to be the one, this was the one where I was going to be able to write man magic and science and bring all of these different genres together. And, and every single time I have flung myself against this wall and have never asked the right question, which is, well, what do readers want to read? Yeah. And that has been really difficult. And so you could, you're still going to write these <clears throat> And I just want to make that clear because you have readers in in here that also listen or writers that are also readers. You're still going to write your your crazy works. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm going to refer to them as. Yeah. But the idea is to kind of tone down the amount of genres yes. <laughs> in something that you still love and still create stories that still matter to you and are still complex and still meaningful just with maybe a little less you know, crazy genres. I would like to be able to describe with what I do in a particular book with three words, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So that like military science fiction, that's, people know what that is. Yeah. Um, paranormal romance, suspense romance, um, paranormal suspense romance. That's, I actually wrote some of those. They sold pretty well for what they were. Um, I think my... Yeah, I yeah. Go ahead. That's I th I think my best of those um hit a couple of minor bestseller lists and uh got very high ratings from from the romance sites and you know and it was because it was paranormal. <clears throat> yeah. Romance. Pa yeah. Well, it was paranormal suspense romance. Yeah. But it was not not saying that that was the only reason it sold. I'm saying that because the genre was clear and right. it was written to to that particular genre right and it fit <laughs> yeah it fit yeah it fit it it was my take on an existing genre that had readers who liked that genre and who understood the rules of the genre and I stayed within the rules of the genre while doing all of my own unique stuff but within the rules of the genre and yeah. that was very challenging you know I couldn't go off on my wild hair races down side alleys and I had to actually I had to actually follow some rules and that made it very challenging and very entertaining to do and a lot of times limitations can enhance your creativity a lot of people think oh no no way you know I'm a creative person I can't deal with rules and limitations no limitations actually push the boundaries and and this is one thing that I really learned mostly through art and then I just started to realize especially with the work that I'm doing now is that you know like you limit yourself to just graphite and an eraser or you you pick up a, an entire um sheet and you just you graphite the fuck out of it and then you are limiting yourself to just erasers in how you're going to create the work or you are limiting yourself to only acrylic it's and not just for one painting but for let's say a series it pushes the boundaries of your creativity it it really your your muse is excited by these limitations yeah and that's that's one thing i learned when i was doing a whole bunch of <clears throat> short stories um and selling them under my pen name i created this limitation of a certain amount of words and a certain story and for somebody who used to write ginormous fan fictions <laughs> super long fan fictions just i i and even my first freaking novel take a chance on me it's like a hundred thousand words for romance <laughs> it was really really empowering for my muse to have this very small word limit and specific type of genre and a specific thing that would happen in the story it, it was kind of like I had this outline this, this forma formulaic outline but I don't like doing formula stuff right. so my muse would play with it and try as hard as possible to stretch and to change things and to well let's do this and and constantly surprising me constantly throwing up things and when you do that as well when you have these limitations for your muse and you say this is exactly what I'm going to be working on this series of things that is this this and that 
then the ideas just just like being a writer in general if you are a writer who actually writes and reads ideas are not a problem for you right it's the same thing when you set limitations and everything ideas are not going to be a problem for you no they're just th- yeah limitations make the game more fun they really do because if if yeah. if anything is possible nothing matters and so i mean in in those big ass descriptions of my our health stuff and my cadence drake stuff i had very firm limitations there was it was just that no limitations on your genre. Yeah, recognizable <laughs> genre was not among my limitations. So uh, this is going to be. I, I want to experiment with. Okay, what can I get if I limit my genre to something that that I can describe in three world, words? What would what would that be like? I'm really excited to to see what you're going to come up with yeah well i don't even at this point know where i want to go i know i know you said urban fantasy was something yeah i it's it's one of the things i'm looking at um but any kind of fantasy any kind of science fiction i mean those are those are my genres those are the things that that i mean even within the very broad scope of what i have done um you know the the suspense paranormal suspense romance that's the, those are the only things I've ever done that were not a combination of science fiction and fantasy. Um, because all of my stuff, all of what it. What about Sympathy for the Devil? What would you call that? Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> well, that was a religious, oh. paranormal, fantasy... Um, God, I think I think that fits religious paranormal fantasy, or not paranormal religious supernatural fantasy. Religious supernatural fantasy, yeah, maybe. <laughs> Is it, now it's kind of sounding like it's describing supernatural the television show, because <laughs> <laughs> that's how I would look at it too. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely religious supernatural fantasy. Yeah, and it's very popular. So. But unfortunately, Sympathy for the Devil and all of those books were, were not. never very popular. No, they were not because um, medical, medical in there too. Yes, not too much. Yes, religious, paranormal, <laughs> supernatural, fantasy, medical. Uh, not paranormal. No. Though. No. No. I don't know. You have. It's supernatural. Yeah. Okay, that's true because it was. It was if you. If you release 60,000 plus devils, demons, and assorted imps into North Carolina with the borders Religious of the state. Yes, yeah. that's, that's supernatural. Yes, that is. I still wish we could follow up on that one story that you created in the other episode where I don't remember what the episode was that we were doing, but you went back to that world and oh, yeah, put a I guy had in the house. Some girl, yeah, who, who had uh, a devil in her basement. Didn't know yes. it yet in the place yeah. that she was. And he was a cocky, funny little shit, too. Yeah. Like, yeah, that would have been fun. <laughs> from another person's perspective, like from me as a reader, I can see this as kind of like the next evolution of your work, which I think is really, really cool. I've obviously, like, I'm a Holly fan because, like, I I like everything. I love everything that I've read from you. Um, and that might sound a little biased, but, you know, whatever. <laughs> Well, I appreciate it. I'm also it. one of those readers. I'm also one of those readers who reads everything. Just anything, everything. I'll give anything a shot. Um and I I actually really love the work, but I also love the idea of the next kind of evolution of your writing and it being this kind of more clear-cut work, you know? Yeah. It, it's still always going to have meaning and reason and I think that that's a lot of things that people need to walk away with is that if you're having a problem especially I mean if you're trying to sell this to a traditional publisher whatever it is that you're writing maybe it's not fitting the genre well enough yeah yeah that's I I intend no matter what I do to continue to have a philosophical meaning to the story a reason yeah. why I am writing it, that a, a thing that matters to me 
And I have done that with every single book I have ever written, bar none. There are no exceptions to this. I never wrote a story that did not have some essential core element of the, the meaning of life to me in the book. Uh, and that, that will continue. I just, I just want to experiment with some slightly tighter limitations on, on the stories themselves. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, I think we made it pretty clear what the the difference is between writing to market versus um, selling out. Selling out, yeah. And and again, you know, it's selling out. People think, well, you know, I will just write for these idiots. This this churned out crap. That I don't think everybody looks at it like that. Well, I think some people might just look at it like, okay, well, this genre sells really well, so I'm going to write in this genre, even though I don't read in it and I don't love it, Yeah, and I am going to make money and people are going to buy what I'm writing because I'm a good writer. And, you know, they might not be my readers, but they'll buy what I'm what I'm working on. Right. But that's not how it works. No, it really isn't because seriously, readers are not stupid people. Yeah. Readers, readers engage in the most complicated form of entertainment of anybody out there. Everything yeah, else I'd... is relatively passive. Reading is not passive. Reading is highly, highly active and requires a, a sort of communion between the writer and the reader. And if one of the two of you is faking it, the other one of the two of you is going to know. Yeah. So Yeah, because I've read plenty in the romance Good God. I've read a lot of books in romance and in various different, um, you know, like lengths and quality of the books. And there have been some silhouette writers that clearly loved what they were doing. Yes. Loved writing. Even if it was cheesy 50,000 word novels, they, they loved the characters. They loved everything. And it made for an enjoyable read. And then you could see the ones that were just plugging in descriptions mm -hmm. plugging in and and i tended to get two or three by the same author in these different different areas and you can see the same descriptions of of the men the same descriptions of the women the same descriptions of sex the same descriptions of how the one person made the other person feel and i know that there is some repetitive some repetition in what you're writing when it comes to romance if you're including sex and stuff i get that there's going to be some repetition but when it's literally it, it looks like all you did was change the story around the sex scenes mm -hmm. when the sex scenes come at the exact same page oh, interviews yeah yeah, yeah. it's it, it does not take long for a reader to especially if you are writing for something like silhouette and you don't understand Silhouette readers, the people who are reader readers for Silhouette or Harlequin, I guess Silhouette's no longer around, Harlequin, any of those types. If, if these, these are the people who will take the, the two grocery, the two Walmart bags from the, from the library and come back for more next week. You are not going to get away with writing like shit with somebody who is reading that much. Right. Right. Exactly. And, and why would you want to? Because if you're not having fun doing it, there are easier ways to make money. Yeah, that's what I was saying last week. Yeah. Like, hell, a nine to five is an easier way to make money yes. than writing. Yes. This is, this is not an easy job. This is a hard job, and getting it right is hard. Yeah. But it's wonderful and fun and challenging if you are doing what you love. And mm -hmm. I, am, I am just looking at... at finding small portions of what I love and trying to focus on those one at a time <laughs> yeah. for a little now, while. Now, <laughs> this is something we have covered a couple of different things that would help you on this topic if you are interested in writing to market. If you maybe are recognizing some of yourself in Holly <laughs> <laughs> and you realize that maybe r trying a new book, writing it to market, would be a good thing to do. So if, if you are looking at that I would say um, first of all try to define what you love to read and what you love to write and boil it down and then what like buy some of the more popular books 
in that genre. Oh, yeah. Or if it is a favorite, favorite genre of yours, then go back to our other episode on how to dissect a novel you love and take the novels that are very clearly written in market for, for the particular genre that you want to work in and then start dissecting those novels. And, I mean, we have so many episodes up at this point that can help with <laughs> yes. this kind of of thing. Yes, and a number of which have worksheets that you can just download. Yes. So, you know, yeah, download the worksheets and tear stuff apart and figure out what makes it tick. And then figure out what you can love about what makes that genre tick and own it. Make it your own. Make it what you love inside of specific limitations. And um, I think I might be doing a little of that myself. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so um, do you have a takeaway? Um, I think that basically the takeaway is just exactly that, that that writing to market is a process of identifying readers who will love what you love versus selling out is holding the people you hope to sell work to in disdain. And one is going to make you happy and give you a fun life writing stuff you love. And the other is going to make you miserable and not going to make you money because readers can smell rats. And if you are going to be a rat, they are going to know it. So Again, there is that Holly extremism when it comes to <laughs> selling out. You can see how she feels about people who sell out. I, on the other hand, just think that, you know, maybe you're trying to make some money in a genre that you shouldn't be making it in. Yes. So. Well, I, I think don't, you cannot look down on people that you, you are attempting to make some creative entertainment for. You cannot. I think that some of them don't, might not look down on it. Maybe they just don't respect Yeah. the people who, like a lot of people don't respect romance readers. A lot of people do look down on them, too. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. A and lot of people... If you're one of those people, don't write romance. Yeah. Because, seriously, these, these are people who engage in telepathy and will try to live inside your head and will know who you are for the first time you, you use a, a, a cheap, cheesy description uh, and a formulaic outline and uh, a, a thrown-together story with no passion from you in it. So yeah, don't don't write to people you don't respect. Yeah. The only reason a lot of those people even still get read are because the books are free. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because Silhouette and Harlequin get passed around so much. Um, okay, so that has been our um, kind of <laughs> all over the place topic. <laughs> the, how, the writing to market versus uh, selling out. If obviously, you know, we, we just kind of we wanted to put this this out there to clarify certain things and if we haven't covered everything that you would love to hear about please let us know if you have any questions if you want to go a little bit deeper into the topic again just let us know you can leave us a message on alone with invisible people.com but the best way to do it is to join the community at holly's writing classes.com that's holly's writing classes.com <laughs> the link is the link is at um alone with invisible people.com in in the notes all of the show notes are going to have all of the links that we discuss but yeah so holly's writing classes.com just sign up for a completely free account you don't have to own any of her classes or anything like that go into the podcast forum it is clearly labeled pod our podcast alone with invisible people and come in and let us know find this episode title let us know what you feel like we maybe we could go in more in depth in or leave us any questions or just comment on it yourself yeah yes yeah. you specific also questions contact. are good <laughs> yes yeah <laughs> you can also find us on the socials that's uh at a-i-a-r-w-i-p on instagram and twitter although <laughs> I mean, we're kind of, I'm kind of really slacker there, but hey, I mean, I do check them and I am trying to come up with something that I can, I can really get passionate about when it comes to Instagram. I'm not really a Twitter person and huh. I'm, I just, I, it's so negative there that I kind of don't want to use Twitter, but, um, I don't know. I don't know. We'll, we'll keep it up and, and you guys tell me if it's worth it if I start using it. 
We were also at Alone in a Room in, with Invisible People on Facebook. Um, if you would like to support the podcast, you have two different options. You can support us on a one-time basis. If you go to alonewithinvisiblepeople.com, top right, there is a way to support the podcast. And then if you would like to support it on an ongoing basis, we have a Patreon. It is Alone in a Room with Invisible People, or you can just look up AIA. RWIP. Um, I really, really appreciate the people who are donating anything, even a dollar to, to, to like $9, I think was the top. Um, or I, I don't know what, I don't even remember <laughs> my, my levels on there, but right now, um, I am actually following another podcaster. You guys have allowed me to become a patron of another podcaster who is teaching uh, different ways to like fix the quality, fix the editing, different, different little, diff- just different little things that can really, really make this podcast even better. And once I'm done learning from him, I will use whatever you guys are still, you know, supporting the podcast with to, um, buy eBooks on the subject, um, buy upgrades on equipment. I just, I really, really wanted to say thank you very much. And I am using your, um, support in order to try to make this a better podcast. So I, I wanted to um, really express my, my gratitude for that because it's, I'm, I'm going to show you guys how even, you know, a dollar from every listener would, would make an, a ginormous difference with this podcast. Um, and again, if you wanted to support a podcast in yet another way, you can support Holly by buying her fiction, her classes, or supporting her on Patreon. Her fiction is available pretty much anywhere. You know, just just look up her name. Her name is uh, Holly Lyle, L-I-S-L-E, just in case you don't know how it's spelled. Um, Or you can go to hollyswritingclasses.com and take a look at her shop. She has a ton of really great classes. You can go to her Patreon. It's Holly Lyle, (laughs) L-I-S-L-E, and um, find her, you know, different levels of supporting her writing fiction in there as well. So, um, if you need to contact us for any reason, it's show at alonewithinvisiblepeople.com, and I believe that's it. I just wanted to say, again, huge shout out to the patrons that are supporting this podcast. It's going to just continue to get better, and thank you. And thank you to every listener we have. And thank you very much. I'm glad you spent this time with us. And now, a word from our sponsor. You want to write? You love words, you love fiction, but you don't know where to start or how to middle or where to finish. I do. I'm Holly Lyle, and I've been doing this professionally since 1991. And I know how I did what I did to go pro, and I'll be happy to show you what I've learned. Start with my free three-week flash fiction class at hollyswritingclasses.com.